So, hi, so my name is Magnus Ivarsson. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Disability Research Division at Linköping University in Sweden. And uh, I'm very happy to be here today to talk a little bit about longitudinal perspective on mental health problems across childhood and children with de developmental disabilities. Uh, and I will basically present some highly prelim preliminary results from an ongoing systematic review. And I will introduce the research program Child DMH. So this research program that I'm a part of uh, is a collaboration between several different universities across Sweden, Australia and uh, Canada and five counties in Sweden. That's the bottom five here. Uh, and it's coordinated by Professor Mats Granlund in Jönköping. So why is longitudinal perspective uh, on mental health uh, important? That's a reasonable first question to ask. Obviously, if you want to collect information about such things as onset or duration or changes or critical periods during the development, uh, there's really no good option to a longitudinal design, right? And it also gives you the uh, possibility to study environmental factors influencing those, the longitudinal trajectories. And this could give you some clues about causality. It, it's not enough to prove causality, of course, but it could give you some sort of sense about what is causing changes in uh, the trajectories over time. And all of these th things, may be helpful when uh, designing interventions to reduce mental health problems. So what does the science say about the longitudinal trajectories of mental health problems in children with uh, DD? Well, to answer this question, we set up to systematically review the literature in the field. And I'm gonna uh, just give a short, short <laughs> summary of some of the results here. So we did this search in six databases uh, in September 2019, using a combination of the search words you can see here, and or many different versions of those concepts, basically. So there were a lot, a lot of different uh, words. And uh, then we have, as always, this process of uh, uh, screening and uh, filtering out the relevant uh, studies. So I'm just gonna summarize it and say, we started out with about 80,000 records, and we ended up with 36. And I will mention that we, had, we also had other sort of smaller streams where we also uh, screened for uh, possible uh, studies to, uh, to include in the review, such as going through some citation searching and, and so, so forth. And as uh, I implied, this was only the first round of uh, the first search. We have to do a new one. Uh, that we are currently working on, because uh, as you can see, there's always, already more than two years since the first such. So which studies were we looking for? Uh, we were looking for studies with participants age 18 or younger, uh, and we had a rather broad uh, scope of different diagnoses that we wanted to include. So cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, autism, and so forth, basically, any developmental disability, as well as acquired brain injury. Uh, and uh, we also had a, a rather broad definition of the outcomes that we were interested in. So we, any, any measurement of that some, in some way tapped into mental health problem was basically uh, included in the study. And when it comes to design, we were looking for studies with at least uh, three different waves of data collection. And there had to be a minimum of two years mean time between the first and the last data collection points. So as you can imagine, when you have such a broad search strategy, you will get rather um, varied uh, results. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how it looks. So starting with the mean age at the first wave, in, in this chart you see here, every dot is one study. And uh, as you can see, uh, one study here had a mean age at about, oh, what can that be, 0 0.7 or something like that years. And another one was way up here at uh, 
a bit more than 11.5. So we had a lot of variance in that variable. But in this chart, I have uh, uh, changed the dots to different figures, as you can see. And each figure correlates with a specific diagnosis of the participants. So there were quite a few different diagnoses covered by the different studies, as you can see. Uh, some, like Williams syndrome here, was only uh, in one study, and others, such as ADHD and autism, uh, were present in several different studies. So there was a lot of variance in that variable as well. Uh, so here I've added the time between first and last wave. Um, uh, as, as a y-axis, just to show you, there was also quite a lot of variance in, in, in that variable. So looking up here in this study, we had about six and a half years between the first and the last data collection point in that study. But in about half of the studies, the, the mean time between first and last was were between two and four years. And uh, adding even more complexity, uh, in, in the different studies, a whole lot of different instruments were applied. So here I've color coded the different figures. So each color correlates with the instrument. And I will just briefly say that, for example, the strength and difficulties questionnaire were used in a few different studies, uh, but many instruments like the, the in, in this study, the one with the blue circle here, they used um, uh, DSM-4 based a checklist, a conduct disorder checklist. So, and that wasn't used in any other uh, of the studies. And that was the case for many, many studies. So, and lastly, I haven't even touched on the methodological aspects of the different studies yet, but just to show you that of course also differed. So this, you see that this one here where, with a blue circle around it, sort of a star figure. In that study, we had more than 600 participants. Uh, and in other studies, such as that one here, we had about 20 participants. So, I mean, this is obviously only one aspect of quality, but just to give you a, a hint of how it looked, we had quite a lot of variance in that as well. So what we're working at now is trying to summarize parts, chunks of the results where, uh, where so is possible. We're not going to do a meta-analysis, uh, but just to give you sort of a, in a visual summary at least, so for example, a few of the studies reported uh, results for the strength and difficulties uh, conduct and emotional problem subscales. And you see that here. And I'm not gonna go through it in detail, just gonna say, you know, we have some tentative uh, conclusions that can be drawn here. The, the, oh yeah, I should say also that in, in this chart, every dot is not a study. Every dot is a time point in a study and every line is a study. So the lines that are higher up here they all include children with adhd for example so that's one thing to look for and um, at the, at, when it comes to conduct problems one could probably or maybe say that at least in four out of six of these studies the last data point is at a lower level than the first so maybe that's something to look uh, at in further depth yeah, I'm gonna. So what, what are the very tentative conclusions of this first uh, uh, search round or the result from the first search round? Well, one thing is we only found one or uh, zero studies for many diagnostic groups. For example, intellectual disability, we didn't find any studies uh, where the participant had ID. As I said, the methodological quality varied. So there were less than 100 participants in about half of the studies. The scales or instruments applied in the studies were ne almost never ad adopted for uh, children with disabilities. And interestingly, or I find this interesting, in uh, about 80% of the studies, uh, the voice of the child was non-present, meaning that they only asked either a parent or a teacher about the mental health problem studies. And the results were often based on raising from one informant, even though guidelines, clinical guidelines, highlight the importance about asking multiple informants from different contexts to get a fair view of the problem. Yeah. Uh, 
and this I, I also find intriguing, the overlap between diagnostic criteria and the mental health problems outcome. Uh, that is when the mental health problem in some way tap into aspects that we tend to uh, see as a part of the disability study. So that was also a problem in many studies. Right. So, and basically we have very little knowledge about longitudinal relations between mental health problems, well-being and participation. And that leads into our ongoing study within child PMH. So we are conducting a longitudinal study where we have, we're, uh, we have collected the first wave of data in spring. So we had 163 participants, as you can see here, and we are planning to follow those children for four or five years and collect data about participation, emotional and behavioral symptoms, well-being, and see how those three constructs relate to each other. Uh, yeah, as you can see, we have, have had some problem with recruitment and uh, we, we should, our plan was to start in March uh, 2020. And you all know what happened at that time. So that's probably one uh, explanation why we have had such, such difficulties. The pandemic uh, hit Sweden in March 2020. And we have a lot of different projects and studies planned within this broader context of the child PMH program. Um, I'm just going to mention a few. So, for example, we, we're looking at the, for another PhD student that's looking at the role of parent ethnicity in child participation and mental health problems, for example. We are validating some scales from this child. The SSF is a Swedish version of the family uh, impact questionnaire, and so forth. So please, uh, if you want to follow our progress, you can do so at the homepage uh, www.childpmh.se and there is an English version of that page if you log on to that. And I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, so here's some uh, more information about CPG and uh, thank you very much for having me and listening to me.